When I first heard about the project, I started walking on my own and saw this image and was so inspired by it to see the way that humans have reshaped the water and people in Milwaukee have reshaped the water. Um, and meeting Steve through this project was great because he was able to bring so much of the history of that reshaping to the conversation. Um, and what he also brought is that we're not just reshaping the water, but we've reshaped the land around it as well. Yeah, and one thing that I think stands out in this image is the sort of geometric shapes on the on the right, 2019, and the sort of the easy curve and flow in 1852, and uh, to get down to how that happened and why it happened and, and how it changed uh, not only the water, but the land and the culture of the people around it is, uh, is a great story, I think. So this is just another um, like contemporary view of what the Harbor District looks like. Um, and this is kind of the route that we've discovered through our walks together in the Harbor District. So it's a little offbeat and we also are gonna talk a little bit about Jones Island because it's, it connects in such a visual way um, to the areas where we are, we are walking. Um, we also wanted to share a few questions with you guys right up front um, that seemed really pertinent to us by the end of our experience walking in the Harbor District. Um, and we invite you to kind of chime in along the way if something if trips one of these questions off for you, if something connects, um, feel free to be thinking about these things and add your two cents in along the way. Um, so how do you balance priorities when developing, um, when you're developing urban space, um, human, industry, um, land, culture? Um, there has to be a place where the city has all of its dirty things happening and how are they integrated with human life? Um, and then also, how would you solve these problems or consider these things and rede redesign this infrastructure um, if you were starting from scratch? So if the landscape was completely back to zero, how would we redesign how it, humans and industry and infrastructure interact with each other? So the first point of interest that we found was on South Water Street, um, kind of right underneath the Hone Bridge. And I think it's it's worth noting that when we did this walk, actually we walked it I think about three times, uh, we encountered very few people and it wasn't just because it was cold. Uh, I myself, uh, lifelong Milwaukeean, had never set foot in most of the places that Sarah and I uh, walked. It almost felt like we were on some sort of um, other planet, <laughs> even though we were in, in Milwaukee. And, you know, from a historical perspective, this area um, really wasn't populated much anyway. It was marsh. Um, it was underwater. Um, the, you know, Lake Michigan fluctuates up to five feet in height about every 20 to 30 years. So sometimes these places were inundated. And this, this map uh, is actually from 1848, where someone drew out some of these areas that were, were high land. Um, there's an area called Walker's Point, that is called Walker's Point because it was one of the only um, sort of dry peninsulas in the area. Uh, you see a few buildings in what's now considered Jones, Jones Island, uh, and there was a Native American village there, but for the most part, this, this wasn't a place for people to live. It was just a place to hunt. Uh, There's a lot of waterfowl, um, there were fish, um, so it was, it was very, very uh, dramatically different from what it became, you know, starting in the 1840s. Uh, in the 1850s, um, especially once they they cut through uh, a big sandbar in order to make um, shipping a lot easier, getting ships up and down the Milwaukee River. So yeah, in this map, you can see the proposed um, cut in that sandbar where they changed the mouth of the river and adapted it from being further south and moved that port to the north. Um, and I just want to recognize that there were native, you know, there were native cultures living along the river and living in these marshes. And so it's interesting as we think about how this space was used, that it's always been identified as a place um, of, like that's been really fruitful, right? So even though there wasn't a ton of um, human interaction with the landscape or change, um, it's always been a place that's provided a lot of um, opportunity and resources and has been an entry point for people to start developing into the city and move into the city space. Um, so I'm also really excited to share these pictures um, up from the Milwaukee Public Library and from the Wisconsin Historical Society um, of this development, um, the port and of the Harbor District. 
So there's just these amazing photographs from above where you can see how they've really changed and filled in. And you can even kind of compare it to that map where you see all swamp. And now you're seeing buildings where there was just marsh or wild rice um, and how fast, I mean, this is a hundred years later, um, how quickly that development happened and to think about the technology that they had um, available to create that amount of change is just kind of um, amazing. So part of what the struggle that I had while I was thinking about the Harbor District is I think about the displacement of people and access a lot in my work, but I also think about, I mean, this landscape um, makes me think about how the ingenuity and the innovation that had to happen to be able to create this port and all of this infrastructure that really helped the city develop. Um, and without it, Milwaukee wouldn't be what it is. So it's just an interesting balance to consider. And one of the things that I learned from Sarah in uh, going about these walks was uh, a way of thinking about barriers uh, you know, actual physical barriers to getting to a place, but also economic barriers, um, maybe even mental barriers, uh, which is one that I had uh, regarding this area and not really thinking about it. And part of it, I think, is that it's one of the few areas of Milwaukee where there is literally almost zero residential space. Um, and that might be changing um, in the near future, but um, by sort of keeping people out for so long. And that's not always been the case, but uh, for the last, you know, 80 years or so um, has, I think, uh, changed that area uh, in a way that uh, a lot of people might not recognize. Sarah, can I ask you on this map, because it's just so cool, or maybe you're about to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I was, because it is so cool. So I just wanted to share that in this picture, you can see the pylons for the Hone Bridge going up. Um, and then by 1975, you can see the completed Hone Bridge. And I think that, I mean, what Stephen's saying is that like the access to this area and that we both had not really explored it in the past or that there's not really residential space or really an, a way to bring people in, I think is um, one of the most interesting parts of the Harbor District. And like this bridge that kind of just takes people right over it. Um, and we even talked about how this bridge for a long time, like it was just kind of going nowhere. So this, what's happening now in the Harbor District is exciting because it is a little bit, um, it, brings, it brings us back to this human element. It starts bringing people back into the space. Yeah, that home bridge picture though is just really exciting. It's, in, it's interesting to see the development. Oh, I was gonna say that that bridge literally was called the bridge to nowhere in Milwaukee for, for many years. and. Uh, there were plans for a much greater freeway expansion um, to be part of that, but those were abandoned. And <clears throat> I think a lot of people agree that that was a good idea. Could I, could I ask you guys um, to talk a little bit about your experiences walking, uh, you know, uh, within or amidst those structural components on Jones Island as like a specific experience uh, within the Harbor District overall? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll start. There was uh, one part of Water Street where when you're walking, there are railroad tracks that are literally up on the sidewalk. And Sarah and I could, um, we had a hard time figuring out if they were active tracks. And uh, it just seemed strange to have railroad tracks that close in proximity to where people could walk and drive. Uh, they then cross a, a, a street and go up a hill. And as far as we could tell, they were active uh, railroad tracks. And we might even have a photo of that. Here, no, I just, I think I'm excited that you're talking about that because I, that was a really fascinating part of our walk um, was to realize just how integrated these spaces that are made for humans are with the industry that exists in this area. Um, and another thing that we both really related to is that Milwaukee has this kind of scrappy attitude um, and has a lot of, in the past, has had a lot of these undeveloped spaces where people, where there was a lot of opportunity for people to kind of create their own projects or find their way in and into the landscape or into whatever business they wanted to create. Um, and that those spaces are dwindling. Um, and this is kind of one of those last 
places in Milwaukee to be really be reinvented. Um, and it really feels like that when you're walking down there right now where they're trying to invite people in, but there's still moments where you're accidentally walking on railroad tracks or where we tried to access the walking path and you have to like cut through some woods and go up over a bridge. And so there are these really fun moments in the Harbor District right now where it's right in between being this indu old industrial space that's not made for people and um, a place that is available for people to walk, um, but the world's quite, haven't quite met yet. So this is just a video of standing down on Water Street um, and of where like industry is really meeting you right in your face. Um, and kind of, there's just, it's just also present. I think another thing that really strikes me about the landscape here is that you can really see so much of it from many different points of view. Like you can see the home bridge here, but every single location that we walk to, you could also still see the home bridge or you can get a good perspective of Jones Island from the plaza, um, but you can also get that same perspective um, when you're standing in other places as well. So there's a lot of visibility that's really fascinating to me in the Harbor District. Did we know the person standing on the train tracks? Yes, that's that's Steve's son. That's, Otis. that's my son. <laughs> Had to get him out of the house somehow. Yeah, maybe we didn't teach him the best lesson to like walk on live. <laughs> but we just trespassed a little bit. <laughs> this is fine. Case in point. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we all survived. Um, so the next spot that we want to talk about is the Harbor View Plaza. Um, and this space is interesting because it's another element, like another instance where they're really trying to bring people in, where like in the past, the Harbor District has really pushed people away. Like Steve talked about, those dividing lines are really, really strong. The boundaries keeping people out of this space are very clear. Um, and this is a space that's really lovely and interactive, but you still get that sense of um, the architecture, like the physical architecture is not necessarily welcoming you into that space. Like, it's very, everything's very big, everything's very under construction. So the um, psychology that exists in that space still doesn't always scream like human interaction. And it, it seems like this, this little area here, the Harbor District where there's the, the park, there's a UWM School of Freshwater Science, there's a, a new uh, headquarters for Komatsu uh, being built that we might see. <clears throat> but there's a lot of other things you see that are typically just hidden from view. Uh, sewage treatment plants, um, you know, big piles of salt, liquid natural gas storage, uh, grain elevators, all these things that our modern civilization uses, but people don't typically see. And I assume those are some of the big things you were talking about in some of your leading questions in the beginning. Yes. Yeah, there's such a um, an interesting set of industry. I mean, it's, it used to be really heavy industry. It's now switching over to light industry um, so that it is a little bit more interactive um, and welcoming to people. It's not quite as toxic as it might have been in the past. Um, but all of that stuff is still really present. And I do, when I approach any project or any space, I always think about who has access, how is the space, how is this public space equitable? Um, and Milwaukee is really trying to value its waterways and present them to the city as like its biggest resources. So I you know, had extra care in thinking about like, okay, so if this is what we're valuing, how do we bring people to this? And Steve really helped me kind of go, why is that important to you? Like, why is it important for people to have access to these waterways? Um, and it's, I think in my head, I realized it was beyond recreation. It's really important for people to see um, how their city works, like, especially in this space, to be able to have access to see the like the infrastructure and the industry and the port and all of these things that kind of make the city tick. Um, it helps give you perspective of how much energy it takes just to have a life in a city, but also it shows you kind of what your lifestyle and like what impact you have on the earth. Um, because not only did the heart, like straightening the inner harbor and building all of these walls in the harbor district push out people, but it also pushed out like any ecology that existed too. So, right, that's not a like a very habitable space for any plants or animals. You're not seeing that kind of interaction with the landscape anymore either. One of the interesting things about the Milwaukee Harbor is that it was almost totally non-functional in the early years and the, the early settlers, they, they knew that 
and it was a combination of not deep enough water. And as everyone uh, who's been in Milwaukee the last few years knows, uh, there's these punishing storms that come off the lake and can literally annihilate um, um, infrastructure uh, on both Jones Island and uh, I think the South Shore Yacht Club. Uh, a couple of years ago was, um, or maybe it was last year, was just about completely destroyed. Um, so a lot of the, the efforts um, that were underway in the harbor beginning all the way back in the 1850s was all about uh, protecting infrastructure and allowing ships to get in and out. And without that, um, they believe that the, the city itself couldn't even, um, couldn't even function. These images are- Aren't they wild? Amazing. So again, I just wanna like say thank you to the online archives of the Milwaukee Public Library and the Wisconsin Historical Society. Um, these are all different images of bu the building of all the different retaining walls. This one's from the Menominee Valley, one is from the lakefront, um, but they all kind of mirror the same retaining wall structures that are in the harbor. And um, so this one is, I mean, they're all built slightly differently. This one is made of wood with, it's just literally filled with rocks and earth and they drop it in. Um, so I just, I find these to just show, I, there's just something striking to me about the amount of effort and um, the challenge it took to kind of build in this infrastructure to create the harbor and to make sure that our waterways are safe for human use. And like Steve was saying that it's not being taken out by storms. It's not like it's protective, but it also is like so transformative and destructive to our landscape. Um, and unnatural, but also necessary. So this is a, a view of the harbor now, what you might see if you go to Harbor Plaza. So we absolutely encourage everybody to go walk in the Harbor District and it might not sound appealing to do in the winter, but absolutely try it in the winter. It's really lovely. And that just the views are unlike anything you'll see anywhere else in Milwaukee. To be able to see the scale of a boat like that is just, it's jarring. I think it's probably frozen enough that you could walk across it now. I wouldn't recommend it, but um, some of these were from earlier, a little earlier in the winter. Well, I, I wanna ask you guys a question. This might be a, a tough question. Um, I think as someone who you know also appreciates history and also appreciates infrastructural, the, the significance of major infrastructural moves uh, 100 years ago or whenever the, the date may have been, um, We've learned so much about the ecological ramifications of those efforts now, and how you know devastating they've been to lots of, you know, just native you know, aqua life or otherwise. And I wonder, you know, how much in just kind of your own sort of side conversations, or how much that's come up, sort of the trade-off between appreciating what we've done versus how much damage it's done. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, you look at the infrastructure that's there now and what it had to displace uh, in order to be there, and uh, virtually every native habitat, every native species that was there was um, was pushed out. You know, Sarah and I talked about the idea of uh, restoration and how difficult that is, and what a difficult concept it can be as well. Um, I think on a practical level, in a place like that, restoration, while not impossible. Um, would be very, very difficult. Um, and then the question is, what do you restore it to? Um, and I, I think that um, that's, a, that's another tough question. You, do you put it under you know, two miles of ice uh, like it was 15,000 years ago? Do you restore it to a marsh? Uh, do you, you know, just make it less toxic? Um, these are all great questions that we discussed. Yes. Everything that Steve just said. We did talk a lot about restoration and we talked a lot about the balance of how you restore things now. And I mean, the, this area has had human interaction and change to the landscape for so many years. It's not like, it's hard to know what to go back to. And we obviously can't remove all of that industry because we need it to function as a city. Um, so yeah, I mean, how do we make it more welcoming and how do we bring some economy back and strike a balance between all these things that we need. And I think that's a lot of those questions that we've mentioned at the beginning come out of that idea of like, what does restoration mean? Um, if we're going to be living in a city, like how do we know the impact that we have on the planet and how do we be aware of that and try to mitigate that? Um, yeah, they're all really big questions. And I think a great example of that, and we'll probably get to some pictures of it, but the 
Uh, the sewage treatment plant that is on Jones Island is one of the biggest um, sort of physical features there. And it, um, it's a great example of something that might seem like an eyesore and seem like um, something that would be wrecking the, the landscape. But on the other hand, um, they're already at, I think, 80% of all of the um, methane that comes out of that is used to power the plant. And they produce a fertilizer called Milorganite, which uh, since I think 1925 has been um, a great organic fertilizer, uh, taking all the waste in Milwaukee and using it for a, for a beneficial purpose. Yeah, it's one of the most like, amazing parts of Milwaukee. It's one of our most innovative acts, I think. The overpass at Greenfield, um, which is just west of where the plaza is, but it's on this wonderful walking path. Um, and I think this also relates back because this whole idea of this walking path and the plaza are these attempts to like reinfuse people and ecology into the space. And I do know that like the Harbor District, um, the organization, they're working really hard to like, they have several like ecology projects in mind to build, to like rebuild the harbor and bring back fish and plants that are native to the area. Um, but I think they also want to make sure that it's like a place where people actually want to recreate and they recognize that nobody's going to want to recreate in an area that's just all heavy industry. So um, bringing in this walking path and this overpass um, is another just like really lovely act. And again, like it, it's not complete yet. So it's really fun to walk on it now and kind of see it in this transition phase where you don't necessarily get, um, you still kind of get the ruggedness of good old Milwaukee, but you um, still get access to this landscape that you otherwise would probably be blocked out of. Um, and again, this is another way, like this is a beautiful spot for me because I think of anytime you get the chance to see something from above or get a different perspective on things, that's um, an opportunity to understand better where you live and why you live there and feel the value of these spaces. And this overlook at Greenfield is one of those places where you really get the perspective of, you can see Jones Island, you can see all the industry, you can see the neighborhood, um, you can see like up into the neighborhoods just west of here. Um, it kind of breaks down some of those barriers. So I think the Harbor District is doing a good job to to build in and change that architecture that feels oppressive and build in these moments of clarity where you can really engage with the landscape. I have if a, anyone likes to cross country ski, this would be a place to go. <laughs> uh, Steven and Sarah, I have a question, a tough question from Barbara, uh, was wow. asking about climate change and the possible dangers of having infrastructure so near the water or the water's edge. Um, I think that's probably more of a moving into the future question than it is uh, something of the past, but how much have you talked about that and how much do you think about that in, you know, within the context of this, uh, this narrative? We did mm -hmm. talk about, I mean, so we didn't talk about climate change specifically, but we did acknowledge that you know, Jones Island flooded this year. And what does that mean for all the infrastructure that exists there? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, I think that the question for anyone who lives on Lake Michigan is like what happens um, as waters change and climate changes. Steve, you had some really great insights when I was like very nervously going, but what, like, why did it flood? And the <laughs> waters are so high and you're like, it, it's a cycle. So yeah. you put some history to that. But Yeah, I mean, we've got about 200 years of data showing Lake Michigan levels and they do fluctuate pretty regularly. So uh, it's kind of nice that the Great Lakes aren't affected by sea level rise. So, you know, the, the melting ice caps won't, uh, you know, necessitate seawalls, but um, the storms, you know, are getting more, uh, more violent sometimes, more regular. Uh, you know, the, we, don't, we don't even have a, a template for, for what's going to happen in the next, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, whether it's evaporation or rainfall. Um, so yeah, we're, we're in un uncharted territory and maybe 200 years is a bad sample size, especially since the Great Lakes themselves aren't that old, but um, it's definitely going to be uh, more variable um, than, it, than it has been. And I think that, you know, it might be a little bit of an obvious statement, but I think it's also really important to differentiate between ocean water and the Great Lakes, even though Lake Michigan may feel like 
you know, an, an ocean view, um, it's not necessarily subject to the same, you know, tidal challenges, I guess, as the ocean water would be. Right now, it's it's uh, near its all time high, um, uh, and about I think it was seven eight years ago, it was near its all time low. So, when it's high, people freak out about erosion and damage. When it's low, they freak out that ships can't um, can't get through. <laughs> I just like that we're at the mercy of the landscape. I think that that's kind of my takeaway from that is like we can bring in all the culture and we can bring in all the changes and we can make all this infrastructure but really we're just at the mercy of weather um <laughs> which is how the conversation started today with snow and cold um so i'm just uh, yeah i think that this area is a, also a good point to kind of pause and just recognize that like the harbor district though it doesn't have um you know a lot of people living there now, it is surrounded by like five of the most densely populated and like diverse neighborhoods in Milwaukee. Um, and there are like some very strong barriers to this landscape for those neighborhoods. Um, and I wrote down a couple, like I don't have many statistics, but I do have like one thought, like, so I've been reading about like the current state of um, the Harbor District and apparently there's, so there's 888 acres in the Harbor District and half of it is transportation and utilities. So that's actually technically public land, which I think is really interesting that these public services create half of this space already. And those really can't go anywhere. Those utilities, we need those. So that's not gonna change. So then it's the other half. Um, and the next biggest kind of portion of the land in the Harbor District is industrial space and vacant property. So I feel like this is um, this is why this area is so fascinating is because half of this space is getting ready to change and the other half is already already belongs to the public. Um, so I feel like the opportunity there for them to build and create access for these neighborhoods that are really just within striking distance um, is huge. Um, and I just keep wondering how they develop these neighborhoods in a way that really reflect and invite the people from those neighborhoods in. Um, so this is another great shot, just if we're thinking about infrastructure and um, all of the utilities that exist in this area, the trains are another huge part of um, the Harbor District. Well, I'll interrupt, I'll interrupt you for a second with another yeah. tough question from Heidi. Um, sure, great. Who, who decides what changes are taking place and will take place? Um, and assuming it's a case by case thing, who's at the table for those decisions? I don't know specifically. I do know that the Harbor District is, there's an organization that's running the redevelopment and they have like a game plan. They have a land use plan and um, some like catalytic um, projects in mind. And you can see that happening with the walking trail and um, Komatsu industry, like that building being built and the water science industry or water science building being brought in. And so there's a lot of things that are already happening with their plan. And I know that they've done a lot of outreach, um, but that's actually one of my biggest questions too, is just like, who's at the table for when we're making these decisions and how do we ensure that this area um, actually reflects and doesn't just become another, I mean, I, it doesn't just become another wealthy redeveloped area in Milwaukee that actually denies access to a lot of residents as well. Um, so that that's my biggest fear and why I kind of love it. And it's the state that it's in is because it still retains that ability to become something that actually reflects Milwaukee residents um, rather than something that continues to hold people out. Yep, and I, I saw a comment from uh, one of the participants talking about um, the, the engagement with, uh, with the surrounding people um, with that plan and I'm you know, it's a combination of don't, you know, the city of Milwaukee, um, there's a lot of people at the table. So um, that's, I think that's a good thing. That's great. Yeah, and I just see a follow up from Julie also that says that she knows residents who have served on the committee and that their voices are being heard. So that is, that is good news. That is great, Julie. I'm glad to hear it. It did look like in their plan, I can share a link to their, um, their plan as well. I mean, it's pretty thorough. And I know that they they did do a lot of outreach. So I'm not sure what's happening beyond that, um, but there is, there is good connections being made. So 
I also want to play this video of a train. The train is amazing because it also connects this space in such a deep way. You're walking on the path, you're walking along the train tracks. And then our last spot, which is, or what, not our last spot, but one of our spots is um, on the KK River Bridge. So on Kinnikinick Avenue, there's a bridge that goes right over the water right before it kind of hits the port. Um, and you just kind of get this amazing walking between the two spaces. You get this amazing connection um, going underneath the railroad bridge, seeing it on your side and then seeing it to your other side. Just this really deep connection to the transportation that happens in that area. We couldn't figure out what that uh, large red steel structure was that was being built, but uh, we think it has probably something to do with Komatsu. This stop for me also really brought up a lot of thoughts about those boundary lines. And we talked about, for Steve and I both, this spot really designated a divider between the Harbor District and being in Bayview. So kind of this like from everything that way was undeveloped and everything this way is feeling like very developed. Um, and so I think that's kind of where some of those ideas of um, how do we like manage that development and make sure that it's happening um, at a pace and at a, you know, in a style that really is inviting for everyone. Um, and one question that I had while we were walking too was like, how do we build in some of that um, kind of the scrappiness that existed in undeveloped Milwaukee. And can you build in opportunities like that for artists or for entrepreneurs? Um, how do we keep some of this space un undecided as things come up and as things build in this area? Right. I think Sarah talked about gentrification, but it's there's not even something to gentrify in a way because it's it's a lot of just uh, either open land or, or differently used land. Uh, but yeah, we talked about um, having it you know stay open. I, I have a question that's coming through that's asking you both. These are all good questions. Thank you guys. Um, to it's sort of like a, a challenge of for both of you to play off of your own different differing perspectives to try to you know imagine kind of a future uh, based on these conversations and can kind of cover that you know as we continue to talk or you know right now um, or at the end but I'm just curious you know I'm sure as you guys have been working on this walking and talking there has been a lot of you know kick back and forth about those varying uh, perspectives and how they connect to this conversation so I'm just curious like what some of the things that came up for you that were really obvious and what some of the ways you guys have sort of challenged each other to look at alternatives to, to what's happening, whether they be idealistic or uh, realizable. Uh, yeah, I, I guess when, when we were having our conversations, one of the things that came up was the, the hard inevitability of so much of the infrastructure that unless you want to see civilization collapse, uh, it kind of has to remain. <laughs> um, I think one of the uh, things we saw uh, coming in and out was this endless stream of trucks that were getting salt. Uh, we've got all the snow and ice and all the salt, I think in Southeast Wisconsin comes into the port. Uh, we saw the ship and I think you, there's a video of that later uh, unloading the salt. Um, and uh, it, was, it was kind of amazing to see. And I thought, well, if, if there was some other way to get salt around, uh, either by ship or by, you know, by rail or by truck, you're just shifting that somewhere else. It, it's, it's sort of necessary for everything to work, along with the sewage plant, uh, the grain elevators, uh, all this stuff is just part of our, our infrastructure now. And um, that's one of the questions we posed at the beginning was, if you were to do this all over again, where would you put these things? Uh, uh, would you still have them here or would they work somewhere else? And could you integrate that with uh, with some sort of you know residential development as well? And um, I, I think that's possible now. I think that you know 40 years ago it would have been so uninviting that no one would have contemplated it. But uh, as things are getting cleaner, um, it's it's becoming a possibility. Like some of the other things that came out of our conversations were um, the idea of, again, like that idea of the architecture being inviting or um, oppressive. And 
So like, how do we make this industry feel welcoming? Like maybe it's information um, <clears throat> or maybe it's just building other things that are on a different scale so that it feels really walkable and it feels accessible. Um, but then also one thing that I know is happening as part of the Harbor District's redevelopment plan is they're connecting Mitchell Street. So they're taking Mitchell Street and instead of it dead ending at first or KK, they're gonna let it go through into the Harbor. And so opening up more of these through lines for transportation, for bikes, for walking, like that is going to help bring people to that area as well. Because um, I think one of the biggest dividers right now is actually the highway. Um, more so than like the industry, the highway kind of holds those neighborhoods back. Um, so finding a way to like break open those barriers to this waterfront, to this amazing point of view to get to understand our infrastructure and our city in this different way, um, that's going to be the biggest thing. And I think that allows more residents to come in and have a voice in how the development happens, but it really is kind of about wayfinding and access um, beyond those like big physical barriers. Our last stop on our walk, which is like maybe the coolest one too, it's Jones Island um, and Kashubes Park, uh, which is, which I spelled it wrong, which is that's so sad. Um, it's just my style. I'm just a bad speller. I'm working on it. So Kashubes Park, Steve, Steve, if you don't mind me, I'm just gonna tell them what you said. We we walked out into this into Kashubes Park and he's never been there before. He's like, this is my first time here, this is so exciting. And then he goes, I just feel like Kashubes Park is just an apology. It's like the city apologizing because they knew they did something really wrong. <laughs> and I just thought that that was kind of um, the best way to sum up what Kashubes Park is. It's like, it's a more of a monument than a park is kind of how he framed it. And I just think, thought that that was a really lovely perspective. Yeah, most parks aren't surrounded by barbed wire fence. I'm just gonna play it again. It's just so nice. Can you talk and, a little um, bit more about, uh, for the people who are lesser familiar, what the apology would be for? So uh, yeah, uh, Jones Island was, uh, uh, a fishing settlement. It was a fishing village beginning in the uh, late 19th century. Uh, some Polish immigrants and uh, it came from the Baltic Sea area settled there and you know this is a great example of how uh, culture and landscape sort of interplay. They found this this area that was perfect for them. They built their houses up on stilts. Uh, they got around on their boats and they made a living fishing on Lake Michigan for a good, you know, 40, 50 years. Um, there was a, a large Polish population on the south side, so they'd take their boats across and go to church on Sundays. And um, it was it was a pretty kind of unique thing. And it existed up until really the 1920s when they built the sewage treatment plant. Um, there was also an uh, iron works in Bayview that was sort of inching its way north. And um, at the same time, the, the native fish population in Lake Michigan was being, um, well, replaced by invasive species, but also um, overfishing was, de was depleting it. So their, even their, um, their economic base was in danger at the same time that other pieces were moving in to push them out. And uh, you can see in this photograph, some of the last houses, I think that was 1938, uh, there was one house left in 1943. Uh, there was an old man who was, uh, I think, born there, and they finally uh, pushed him off the island, and that's where they built the park. <laughs> yeah, for us, we just thought Jones Island is this kind of great reminder that, like, we're changing this landscape once again. Um, we're trying to infuse people. We're trying to infuse nature back into its story. Um, but Jones Island will, like, remain... A hub of industry and it's going to have to remain you know like they're not going to change what's happening here we need mmsd needs the you know water um, sewage treatment plant and we need that salt that salt's coming in on those barges and we need that for the roads and there's so many things that are happening on jones island that are essential to the way our city works and so we'll always have this kind of reminder of um the importance of this industry and of like how our city functions. Um, and that shapes that shapes us, that shapes our culture. So this is just a video. I mean, it's not the greatest video because you can't see it, but it was just incredible to see this box 
in the background. These ships are just, the scale of them is just amazing. Um, and this barge here is dumping salt onto this huge mound. And like Steve said, there were just trucks lined up down the block picking up salt. So it's just this constant cycle and the kind of motion and um, energy that you get when you're walking in these spaces around the Harbor District is kind of incredible. Like you just get a sense of how much energy goes into making our world function. It's it's almost like a, a big artery or something like that uh, yeah. with the yeah you know, the sewage coming in the salt um, the the grains all this stuff is just moving constantly in and out and um, how they got through the ice I have no idea but somehow they do yeah that was a big question we had was like if the boats can move in the ice or if there's something that they use and I did find a really great picture. Um, of some boats in the 1980s, which doesn't look like the 1980s, but they're like actually pushing the ice away so that they can move the boat through, um, which it's just incredible what we do to manage these, like to manage the weather, to manage our environment and to continue like to pursue this, um, you know, for lack of a better term and to be real cheesy about it, like the American dream. So, <laughs> you know, like we just try to, we're doing our thing um, but it takes so much effort and so much energy and so much ingenuity. Um, and I'm excited to see this next phase of the Harbor District and see how they can really infuse um, people back into that and bring nature back into that and, and use our ingenuity for good. So these are just a couple of more pictures of um, the, the sewage treatment plant where we actually clean and um, extract any um, impurities from the water, from the sewer, sewer water, and put it back out into Lake Michigan. And it's one of the most like innovative in the country. Um, and if it hadn't been for them building it in the 1920s, this would not exist in Milwaukee because the cost of doing something like this is just way too exorbitant. So they were able to maintain it, but if they had had to like purchase this and make it happen any later in our history, we would not have had such good infrastructure. So it really is incredible that it exists. Right. Yeah, and I think uh, Mary had mentioned earlier something about a lighting project at MMSD um, with uh, indicating something about sewage overflows and uh, that a facility used to have pretty regular sewage overflows when there was too much rain, say over you know two inches of rain over a short period of time. And uh, Milwaukee, beginning in the 1980s, built a tunnel system that has uh, vastly lowered that. So that's another thing that you know could bring people back to a place like that by just um, you know spending more on that kind of infrastructure to keep it cleaner and more attractive and just better for everyone. Julie is raising a really interesting point and an interesting question in the chat. Um, she's talking about. Uh, maintaining dirty parts of our city while integrating people with them, how much do we have to gain from actually interfacing with all the parts of our cities that we tend to sort of, you know, either bury or hide, um, but asks a very specific question about salt. And she mentions uh, that a need for always needing salt, but do we, um, and the question as to why we hide the salt, maybe it'd be helpful not to and or pursue alternatives. Um, and she even goes as far as to suggest whey is a good alternative. And I know that there are um, certain parts of the country where salting is actually illegal because it drops into the waterways and is very, you know, damaging to fish habitat, et cetera. So just curious about raising that little bomb for you guys. I just think that's a great point that like when we have access as a city to the infrastructure and to the things that are happening to maintain our city, we have more ability to change what's happening, right? When we can see it and we're integrated with it, then we actually can have say, and, you know, we don't want to use salt, we want to use whey. Um, so I think that there's a real opportunity there. Um, and I do think that probably those pieces have been hidden so that there's not that public input. <laughs> that would just be my hunch is that those things are kept at bay so that, you know, they can kind of do what they need to do and nobody's really seeing it. Um, but I, I do really appreciate that Milwaukee is like starting to open those doors a little bit more. Um, and I hope that it does mean that there's more innovative and effective and um, just better ways to do what we're already doing. 
Uh, I'm also using I, the Bible. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I, I just wanted to jump in and say, you know, you're revealing such interesting things about this area, which may be uh, a, a little bit uh, opaque to people who don't live in Milwaukee, but uh, it introduces them to the topics. But this uh, inner harbor area has such uh, amazing potential. I really agree with Julie that, you know, it's a place where Milwaukee can really meet uh, the infrastructure that keeps it alive and understand it. But uh, one area, I don't know if you got down there to the Grand, Tr Grand Trunk wetland, because that's so interesting in this very industrial area. So I just wanted to kind of mention that again, it, a very different uh, part of the Inner Harbor. You know, I've read about it and I heard the talk with John, um, Jim and John that was earlier in the call series. Um, and they talked so much about ecology in this space, but I don't know a lot about it. And actually, like Steve said, this is like really, for me, I I value exploring different parts of Milwaukee as part of my artistic practice. Um, and this is still an area that I felt very unfamiliar with. So. Um, Entering in at this moment of like big change is exciting and I still have a lot more of exploring to do. But yeah, I've read about the Grand Trunk project and it seems very cool. Um, there was a, a good point that Stacy uh, asked specifically, Sarah, you're nodding your head. I kind of want to just challenge you to take it since it's really talking about the oh. artists, but um, the market forces that are basically looking to displace industry and turn it into waterfront property. And if that's a good thing or a bad thing, I guess, but uh, how do artists fit into that process of keeping these landscapes accessible? Um, yeah, I was just nodding my head because I read it too and I really appreciated that, that thought. Well, I think I'm, I'm drawn to that idea of like how, I think one of the things that drew me into the area was thinking about like the cycles of development and how that affects how people use the space and how our culture develops with those cycles. And so, you know, like Jones Island um, and housing and then that develops into industry and now we're going back to this like more commercial housing use and I do also see the potential that you know we're just going to go back to like oh now it's just valuable waterfront property and it only exists for these people and um, it does it loses some of its access as public space mm -hmm. um, and I do think artists play a big role in that I think that um, watermarks project and call is like a great example of how you keep connecting people through experiences and how artists can lead those experiences. Um, but then also like to use those experiences as a way to vision what we really want that space to be. I know that we're coming up on time. Um, I wanted to ask everybody if they have any, you know, uh, last minute questions to so please throw them in now. We can stay on for a couple more minutes, but just throw them into the chat function. Uh, and we'll ask Stephen and Sarah to address them before we cut out. But uh, in the meantime, while we're waiting for anything to come through, Stephen and Sarah, I wanted to ask you both a question just about how this experience has changed, um, not just your outlook on the harbor, but just in general, your, your work. Uh, and I want to kind of give you both a chance to answer that question and then I'll ask any other questions that come through. Sure. Um, well, I, I really enjoyed taking the walks with Sarah. Uh, it was good to just explore part of the city I hadn't explored before. Um, it, it took this place that I'd always thought of in the abstract and, and made it real. And I think that would be the benefit of any of these walks is is making something real like that. It's somewhat unfortunate we have to do it virtually, but it's the best we've got right now. But um, um, seeing it firsthand and talking to her about it, <clears throat> um, it just seems like it has so much more potential than I previously imagined. Uh, I always thought of it as this sad story of a you know wrecked ecosystem, um, the pushed out kashubs, and um, something that you know was was sort of left to. Uh, be a wasteland, but it's it's nothing like that at all. And to see the the things that are coming back um, and the things that are you know th there's just so much potential for for cool things to happen there now. And to see it firsthand was was really exciting. Yeah, I agree. It was just really um, a pleasure to like be in that space, and especially in the middle of a pandemic, have the opportunity to meet a new person um, was really amazing. <laughs> And I appreciated walking with Steve so much and getting a fresh perspective and and really a perspective that challenged, even if it wasn't that you disagreed, like just challenged my own thinking and my own instincts about how I read a space. Um, and 
I do think like I, for a long time, have believed that artists belong um, in many places beyond an art gallery. Um, and so I, I appreciated this opportunity as one example of how artists can kind of really dive in to conversations with other specialists like historians or scientists and to analyze these spaces that we're influencing um, and hopefully make some impact at, or like have decision-making in the planning of them or like redesigning of them. Um, so yeah, this is, and it just has been nice to walk <laughs> outside and see any <laughs> part of the city. It just doesn't happen in the middle of a pandemic that much. So it's great. I, I think that that is not a small comment to make whether it's pandemic or otherwise, I think, you know, opportunities to go outside and actually interface with real things um, is going to become, you know, increasingly one of the challenges that we all face and we need to continue to encourage people to do things in that way. I'm seeing another note from Stacy. Yes, I definitely think looking at the ways that artists can create new experiences. Um, the, these are the types of conversations we're looking to sort of start and facilitate here are just, you know, unique new opportunities to look at the same things. And I think that there's not one path forward. I think we have sort of control over that path forward and the best way to sort of select the most appropriate, meaningful and productive one is to have conversations about everything that brought us here and everything that's possible now. So I think that you guys have asked some really good questions. Um, I will say that uh, pandemic or not, the photo references, it's a really nice way to see snow and not feel cold. So <laughs> thank, thank you for that. Um, and I think at the risk of going too much over time, I want to thank everybody for staying on the call for the duration. Uh, I want to thank Sarah and Stephen again for leading us on this fabulous walk uh, and remind everybody to follow City is Living Lab on Instagram at, at City is Living Lab. Um, and watermarks at watermarks MKE and uh, records of this, if anybody is interested, will come become available sooner than later. But thank you so much. Um, these conversations are only meaningful because we have people to share them with. And we really hope that you will all pay some nuggets of this conversation forward, moving forward. So happy Friday, happy weekend. And thank you, everybody. <laughs>